Hey guys, and uh, yeah, <laughs> welcome back to another episode of the PH Journals podcast. It's been a while. Um, yeah, I've been very, very fortunate to have just completed a 14-day safari. However, I was going to jump on this podcast a little bit earlier, but we have had unbelievable weather. It's been absolutely disastrous. Uh, the winds have been howling. Half of the roof is busy coming apart and it's just been absolutely devastating in the lower parts or in the middle of the eastern cape um however we have somewhat recovered a little bit we've had a we've had two days now of, of good weather so gives us a chance to kind of get back into the swing of things unfortunately we still don't have a little bit of le or any electricity uh, so we are running the generators at the moment so you guys might see behind me the little flickering light uh, that's just the generator going so i do apologize about that if you are watching this on youtube however we yeah i've got some incredible stories to share with you guys and a very very special podcast a podcast that i've i kind of found at the time of thinking no I'll, let me let me try and rephrase that uh, somewhere along the point where i kind of in my career, I kind of thought it was such an important part of who I've become. Um, I kind of felt like it was irrelevant to share with you guys. However, um, chatting to Carl and some incredible individuals over the past couple of years doing this this um, podcast, I've been fortunate enough to actually embrace and, and experience it firsthand. And this week's episode, we're going to be talking about patience. Might sound a little bit cliche when it comes to hunting however probably one of the most important aspects i have learned out in the field and i'm going to share with you guys some of the moments some tips and tricks on how we can handle patients and why it is so important out there uh, it often gets overlooked for a lot of the time especially as a young professional hunter i've done it many many times i do it i do it even right, right now as we speak um the other day i kind of got a little bit impatient with myself however it's such an important aspect on when you're hunting and then most importantly when you're professional hunting so yeah i'm looking forward to chatting to you guys about this one i've broken it down into a couple of segments and i think you guys will enjoy this but before we get into it just a couple of things to mention firstly um i don't know if you guys have or haven't yet uh, Head along to the last episode, episode 51, where I had a very, very special interview with Carl Fansell from John X Safaris. I learned a lot out of that. Um, I'll be honest with you, um, my first, my impressions of Carl and, and, and John X Safaris as a whole, I've always admired them from a distance, um, but never really been able to understand them on a personal basis. And I mean that with the greatest respect. However, sitting down with Carl, I got a completely different viewpoint on Carl as an individual, as a hunter, as an outfitter, and most importantly, as a conservationist. <clears throat> and then walking around John X establishment, I kind of, I, I, even, even right now, as I sit here, I get goosebumps thinking about individuals that have taken this industry by the scruff of the neck and, and, and have turned it into a landmark for conservation. And, and that's truly what they are. I mean, while I was there, as we broke, as the team broke for lunch, um, we were I literally was packing away the gear and there were just these warthog just cruising, like no pressure behind them, whatever. And, and for me to see an establishment of that sort that hunting is bred within the industry and within their own establishment and it's and it's a rich hunting history for them to have for them to climb the mountain and be at the pinnacle of conservation in, in the eastern cape it says a lot and i respect Carl more now than i ever did before and it was it was a very very incredible episode so if you haven't yet i would highly recommend i did have a few <laughs> camera issues i guess that's part of the the deal when you when you are doing this all by yourself and you don't have a production crew behind you but if you guys haven't yet head along to youtube spotify um, apple podcast itunes wherever any of the main streaming platforms google play um, 
and go and listen to episode 51. You'll learn a hell of a lot about the industry and how far John X Safaris have come and, and what they've accomplished over the past couple of years. So that was a special one for me. Um, and then while we're on the podcasting topic, guys, if you guys want to get involved in the, in the podcast, we have we are looking. There's been a lot of requests, especially from South African hunters, to um, answer a lot of the questions around South African hunting. It's been a big topic on the podcast for the past couple of, of episodes, um, and I've yet to have any individual. I've asked around on Facebook. I've made a couple of phone calls. Unfortunately, a lot of guys are camera shy when it comes to these sort of things. And I'm more than happy just to do a voiceover um, podcast if, if that may be. Um, however, I do. I would love to have somebody that, that is established in the hunting industry that accommodates biltong hunters and trophy hunters why they do that and, and ask just various different questions and, and get some answers that a lot of people have been asking me to get um, from this side. And that was one of the big reasons why I had call on. Um, people wanted to find out the reasoning behind uh, price. Um, why is the South African outfitter outprice the F South African hunters within the industry? I think he answered it extremely well. And his viewpoint on it as a commodity rather than just a, um, a source of meat was very, very important to me. And, and it's, a, it's a lesson I've learned and I think, I think it's something I'm going to be taking along with me for a very, very long time and, and incorporate it in my own lifestyle. But I'll get more into that as we go on with these sort of podcasts. So if you guys do know anyone out there that would happily, I, I don't mind packing my stuff up in a day's advance, heading down to wherever they may be, if they are willing to sit down and have a discussion with me. Um, I think it's important going forward to understand both sides of the corner. And uh, this would just, just add to it. And um, yeah, to close off on, on this little topic, um, if you guys, once again, would like to get involved with the podcast um, and you feel that you, you could bring some sort of um, credibility or some sort of um, educational aspect to the podcast, please guys, get in contact with me. Um, yeah, I would love to sit down and have a conversation and, and chat to you guys. Uh, we've got a bunch of really exciting guests lined up and I'm looking forward to it. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping to get Doug back on the, on the, on the mark very, very soon from splitting image taxidermy as we are going to need to start tackling a very, very important aspect, um, in the hunting industry and that's shipping, trophy shipping. Um, so hopefully we'll get in, we'll get into that, but, uh, yeah, we've got a couple of awesome guests lined up, so I'm looking forward to this one. And then, um, if you guys would like to have any one of your hunting stores, offers, uh, any sort of outdoor activity, outdoor gear, whatever sponsored on the show, please once again get in contact with me. All my details are up on my website at www.phjournals.com. You guys can head along there and everything is up there. And if you guys would like to find out more, just hit me up on any one of my social medias. I'm, I'm very, very happy to answer as many questions or, or any concerns as they come through. So, yeah, once again... <clears throat> If you guys have, thank you so much for all the support. Guys, honestly, um, I don't think I ask a lot, but if you guys haven't yet, I would appreciate it if you do like, subscribe, and do all those things below, even dropping a thumbs up or, or, or a comment of great episode or, or you didn't like it or whatever maybe. It really helps the cause going forward. And the more traction I can get, especially when it comes to YouTube and Spotify and um, Apple Play, uh, Apple Podcasts and all those sort of stuff because it just grows the show more than you guys will ever know. And once we get into those algorithms, at the moment we're sitting in the top 5% of podcasts in the world out of three more than 3 million podcasts, which is incredible. And I couldn't have done it without you guys. And I'm, I'm feeling very very grateful so uh yeah firstly before <laughs> i get into this episode thank you so much i really appreciate it and um yeah so guys um yeah and then just to have a, everyone have a little recap uh, we did an episode in june um like i said i've been trying to do episodes on a constant basis wherever i get opportunities and time um However, on the 23rd of June, Pat Dugan came out, a very good friend of mine. You guys have known him on the podcast. He's been on a couple of episodes. Unfortunately, this time, we didn't get the opportunity to do a podcast because the lodge where we were based didn't have sufficient Wi-Fi, um, which, was, which was beautiful in, in, a, in a way. Um, so we just, the opportunity never presented itself, and I never really... 
when I do podcasts, I never really want to force the situation because uh, it doesn't it doesn't show true reflection. Put it that way. Um, however, we had an incredible day, or incredible safari. It was a it was a safari met with many many challenges. I learned a lot on it. Um, we didn't hunt as hard as what we should have. Um, however, it was more for patches to have a little bit of a break. But also he he went to go and see a couple of properties that he was quite interested in. Uh, we got to spend a lot of time with the family and and do family things, which was which was very very special. I got to shoot my very first Nyala. I've never shot a Nyala before, so that was cool. Um, so yeah, we did we didn't hunt hard. However, we we had an, we had an exceptional safari. It was it will be one that I'll be very very grateful for in the future. So. <clears throat> Getting into the episode eventually, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so patience, why did I decide to talk about patience? Well, firstly, um, there's two scenarios in my hunting career that I, I often look back at or I often sit around on when I've got a bit of time or when I'm glassing. There are a lot of scenarios that come through in my head <clears throat> and one of them is when I used to fish with my old man, um, it was always a special time for me because me and him really got to bond. And my dad had this incredible amount of patience with me, whether it was racing motocross, fishing, um, hunting, whatever it may be, we, my dad was exceptionally patient. It was, it was incredible to see. Um, for instance, fishing, it was, I wasn't tying the knot right or I was reeling in too quickly. Um, However, I always managed to get lucky. But my dad always used to, especially when we sat down on the rocks and, and both our lines were in the water, and I would say to him, Dad, I'm getting a bite, I'm getting a bite. He would just say to me, my boy, just be patient, just be patient. And that rings in my head a lot of the time. And going through my mental battles where I've been in the past couple of years, it's... I kind of got stuck in the rat race at first, especially being a young professional hunter coming into the industry. I was chasing a different side of professional hunting. I was, cha I was chasing the evil side, the money side. Um, I wanted to get safaris over and done as quickly as possible so the tips and the day fees can come in as quickly as possible so that we can get on to the next one, you know, because it's a rat race. We're chasing, we're chasing that wheel. And... I often used to make very impatient calls. But the more I kind of phased out of chasing the dollar dream and started focusing on what was part of conservation, the more I started realizing how important patience is in the field, especially as a professional hunter with a paying client. So what I've done is <clears throat> I've broken it down into two different segments. From a professional hunting side, what I think is expected of you when you're out in the bush, um, and those scenarios come in where you have you are forcing yourself to be patient. And number two, from a client's perspective, um, why I think clients need to be patient in certain scenarios. Um, and yeah, we'll get into it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna handle the professional hunting side first because hopefully that kind of relates back into into the client side of things so firstly um one of the big things that i've always misread and i've always i didn't pay too much attention to until i started finding the joy in picking up clients from the airport so what does this mean well, what i'm trying to say is be patient in getting to know and understand your client do things like figure out what his sort of persona is. Is he like a get up and go type of guy? Because you guys need to understand is that when, when clients come out to Africa, especially first timers, they're buzzing with excitement. So to calm that situation down, what do you do? You open up conversation and conversation doesn't only have to be, I always try and say, and I think I've said this in a couple of podcasts before, but I always try and say, when you're a professional hunter for a client, 
at the end of the safari, 90% of the time you'll leave as friends because you get to know each other on such a personal aspect. So don't delay getting to know the personal side of him. Try and click into the box as quickly as possible. So I always say take take the time. You know, whether if he's arriving <clears throat> before lunch, take the time to get to know him, have a chat to him, make sure that you, you know, once all the indemnity forms, the paperwork is out of the way, get to know him and, and really just get to know your clientele on a personal level, you know. Figure out what their sort of persona is. How are they going to react when there's missed opportunities, when there's busted stalks? How are they going to react when um, wounded animals are around? Because you guys need to understand that patience needs to come from both of you, not just one side. Because if it's only coming from one side, there's a lot of things that can creep in from frustration to anger to um, making misinformed and bad, bad judgment calls. So... Um, Get to know your client. Get to know him on a personal level. Understand his hunting history. That's also a big one as far as that's concerned. And then also try and figure out what his personal preference is when it comes to shooting. You know, take the time, chat to him. Even, even whip out one of those shop placement books. I know there's apps on your phone that you guys can get. Pull up the app. Talk to him through it. Let him start telling you what his personal preference will be on certain situations and then you guide him in on what you believe is correct on those sort of animals guys once again i just want to point out at this point of the podcast is that these are my personal experiences my personal views so i'm not saying what everything everything that i'm saying right now is correct it's just what i figured out in the past 14 years as being a professional hunter because I never got the opportunity to acknowledge all these things until very, very late on in my career. And I'm hoping there's a couple of youngsters that are listening to this podcast that will take a couple of pointers out of this and utilize them in their own hunting safari. And hopefully it turns out a lot better than what what they interpreted or what they expected. Um, Of course, another big one as far as pHing is concerned. is range time now i am not a range fan i hate the range i really do i honestly i think it's i think that and the admin at the end of a safari i think i think the range for me is probably one of the worst worst parts of it and i have my personal preference on that because i'm not a very good target shooter put an animal in front of me and I've got my rhythms and I've got, even though I've got back fever like you can't believe, that's fine. I can, I know I can shoot straight and I know I can shoot well. But put me on a range with a dead set rest and all that sort of stuff. It's, everything just kind of goes out of the window. Um, not that I shoot badly. It's just I do not enjoy it whatsoever. And it's, it's like that with my clients as well. I don't enjoy the range. I really, really don't. It's probably one of the most important aspects of any safari, but I really, really don't. Um, especially if clients are bringing out their own rifles, take the time, make sure that those rifles are shooting 100% correct. One thing I would recommend, and I hope my good friend Bossy is listening to this because it's happened to him, and Boss, I hope you don't mind me mentioning it, but... It's happened to him right now on, on a recent safari where um, animals have left wounded without spilling a drop of blood. And it's important to understand that why is that happening? There could be so many different variables to it. On my personal experience, what happened to me in the past was clients bring over their own reloaded ammunition. And I've done a podcast on this. They bring out their own reloaded ammunition and it doesn't expand as well as what it should do on a lot of the more softer species. And what I mean by that, the more planes game stuff like Impala, uh, Blessback, Springback, and that sort of stuff. We lost a lot of animals because the bullets were just whistling straight through them. And I never really spent the time in understanding what was actually going on. And I should have done that at the range. So again, guys, these are lessons that I've learned over the past couple of years that when I look back at my career and say, Shucks, you know what, next time I'm not going to make that same mistake. 
it's okay to take an extra 15, 20 minutes at the range and be a little bit more patient and precise about what you're doing there. Make sure that the rifle is shooting straight at 100 yards. If, you want to, if you've zeroed it in at 200, it should be shooting an inch or two high. Um, just make sure that those little things are kind of dialed in. And once again, you are the professional hunter. You make the call. So... And that's where the personal relationships will start gelling together is because the client will have trust in you that you're doing the right thing. Even if you are frustrating him by spending an extra 10, 15 minutes at the range. However, he will understand that this is probably an important aspect of the safari. Um, with that being said, it leads me up into the next side of things is stalking. <laughs> I think, I wonder if there's an accurate way of actually, <laughs> I've, I've, I've just been watching our Remy Warren online on, on YouTube and um, I think there was an episode of just him having busted stalks. I, I often look at, at a lot of my safaris when I go back and I think how impatient I was. And... Uh, I'll never forget. I had a bow hunting client. It was for an out. It was a, it was a TV episode for the Outdoor Channel. I can't I can't remember his name. However, I remember the cameraman's name was Dayton. Dayton was the the cameraman, and it was a special safari because I was young. I was probably about twenty two at the at the at the time. It was my second year as a professional hunter. I was still playing sports at the time, so I would, I would, I would come away. <laughs> I would come, I would come from the rugby academy. I would head straight into um, uh, get my hunting gear, shoot out to the farm, <clears throat> and sort of like jump onto it. You know, like I'm buzzing, I'm hunting, and I'm, I'm getting into it. I haven't had time, like two or three days to prep. I've had to prep in like 45 minutes, get out to the farm, and so so the whole adrenaline rush was there, but. So I get out to the farm and it's a it's a it's a bow hunt for a TV for the outdoor channel. I can't remember what the program was. I, I don't think they exist anymore or whatever it may be. But so on one of the hunts, we were hunting a zebra, and the cameraman there was there was a, there was a husband and wife, and the cameraman dates and he went off with the with the wife. And I was going to film the husband. We were meant to be shooting out of a blind. So it was pretty simple. We were sitting in the blind camera set up. Anyway, cut a long story short. We see this herd of zebra. <laughs> and there's, once again, patience. Instead of being patient and just watch them kind of graze into position, I decided no, now is a good time for us to break out of the blind and head off to this herd. Because I had seen a stallion in there that, I, that it was a beautiful stallion and a beautiful coat. But it gave us a great opportunity. <clears throat> so anyway, we break out and I head we 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 cruising. I'm I'm a very intense stalker, so um I like to take risks when I'm stalking, hence why I'm probably my success rate between the stalks and I'll get to that. But um so we get within a hundred yards and he turns back to me and he says, well, he, he taps me on the shoulder and he says to me, he says, listen, I think you need to stay here. Now that just flipping shattered me in my tracks. I was like, well, how am I going to get close enough to watch or film you shoot this animal? So he kind of instructed me that all I got to do is make sure that the camera is focused on him up until he gets to the zebra or gets into range in the zebra. And then not to zoom in when he draws back, but then just pan out to the zebra. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, we get into range. He closes the distance to about 40 yards. But this has taken two and a half hours. I've been two and a half hours on my ass, on my knees, on my ass, on my knees. You know, trying to get him pins and needles in my ankles and places and stuff. And... That hunt taught me so much, not only about bow hunting, but so much about my stalking and where I was going wrong. Because I watched an individual close 60 yards on an animal in two and a half hours, doing everything by the book. He landed up shooting that zebra. We got great footage. It was it turned into a beautiful show. But that's where the patience for me was taught. 
when it came to stalking because I realized there and then that, wait, hang on, yeah, I've been doing this all wrong. I've been busting animals way too much. I mean, there were, there were days where I w- w- would go by with me not having put my clients into a single position because of my stalking and how aggressive I was in stalking. So that's where it changed for me. I took a lot more time and um, and as I've gone on in life, as I've gone on in my career, um, it's been very special to witness. And for instance, I had Zach over um, on his safari and he taught me about the thermals. I've hunted for 14 years and thermals was the only thing I learned now. And I never want to stop learning. I always want to carry on learning and that's part of being patient is understanding that somebody's going to teach you something. You're going to have to be patient in learning it and and implementing it into your career so for me that's a big one is stalking although it might be frustrating to a lot of people especially with our animals and i try and explain this to north american hunters and i try explain this to a lot of guys that haven't hunted south africa or africa is that there are a lot of our species wildebeest red art to be a springback impala herd animals eland whatever you may <clears throat> it's high intensity stuff because they're big herds and you're trying to close a gap and there's adrenaline pumping and to to try and calm the situation down and take your time in getting closer is very very difficult um for me personally I, i'm not sure for other guys out there but however i am talking from a personal experience so take that time you know if it's going to take you 10 minutes to get to the next bush take that 10 minutes it's all part of the experience and let them let the clients enjoy it along the way so stalking for me was a big one and then after stalking of course comes the opportunities now if you've done everything by the book the opportunity shouldn't take long right but sometimes those animals, I mean, we have just experienced, I shared it on my social, on my Instagram and Facebook page, about the Nyala not stepping in the right position. We waited for about two and a half, no, about two hours, no, less. Call it an hour and a half for the Nyala to get up from him being better down and slowly get into position. You know, sometimes <clears throat> the animal is just not going to be standing broadside. Sometimes it's not going to give you the most ideal shot. But it's key to understand that if you're patient enough, more often than not, good animal understanding would have you understand that that animal will slowly shift into position or will feed into a certain way that you can maneuver yourself around and get into a better position to obviously take that shot. A lot of the time, and I've seen it so many times, especially on the high adrenaline and stuff, buffalo, I've done it on hippo. Um, I'll tell you a story about the hippo. And I think I've shared this on, on the podcast. We get down to the fish river. And my good friend Jared, if he's listening to this, I'm sure he would he would testify. We get down to the fish river. We've hunted seven days hard for this, for this group pot of hippo. We saw this bull on the first day. We never saw him again. Now it's a river and you can only see as thick as as well two or three feet in front of you the bush is just incredibly thick however there are certain patches in the bush where there's clearings grassy clearings so on the seventh day we're kind of running out of time jared and them were there for 10 days i sent my trackers up up river with the radio and the idea was for them to try and push the, the pot of hippos down while we set up in one of these grassy areas. It worked perfectly. And in, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. And on the opposite side of us, it wasn't, it wasn't a far shot. It was about 20 yards. On the opposite side of the, the river, against the bank, under a tree in the shade, was this big bull hippo. And the bull hippo slowly could start hearing the commotion coming down from the river. So he slowly broke away from the banks, obviously either wanting to go up because there were cliffs around us. So I anticipated the sound was distorting him. He wasn't quite sure where it was coming from. So he was either going to go up or he was going to go down. 
but he moved he moved very slowly away from the bank and nothing had deterred him so now by this time he's about 16 yards in front of us armed with a 375 and a 458 jared the hunter had the 375 open sight and the hippos he turned to a point where the nose was f facing away from us and all we could see was the back of his head and our experience has I, I, by that point i had hunted a number of hippos but experience would have me say that that hippo would have turned should have turned and faced us so that we could have get a we could have got a frontal shot in the middle of the forehead but impatience crept in day seven it's been as frustrating as as ever we've driven a hundred k's there and a hundred k's back every single day waking up at three o'clock in the morning going to sleep at 12 o'clock at night it was a painful experience by day seven it really was and i never waited i instructed jerry to take the shot and unfortunately we lost that hippo so understanding patience when it comes to opportunities take your time guys if that animal is not standing correctly don't take that shot whether it's a impala or whether it's a cape buffalo too many guys have taken impatient shots on cape buffalo hence why a lot of them have lost them so make sure that you incorporate that or just have it at the back of your mind next time you're stalking in on black death or impala or bless back whatever it may be so just once again personal experiences what i've learned shot goes off animal goes down it's time for pictures <laughs> i'm actually going to release a, a episode on youtube about professional hunters and taking pictures and what is the correct way well there's no correct way but but what is what is a great way to take photos for clients um spend the time guys <clears throat> as frustrating as it might seem for for clients take the time take beautiful photos take a thousand photos take as many as photos as your camera or your cell phone can take because that's representing you it's representing the outfitter and that client's going back with that memory so be patient with the photos frustration <clears throat> a lot of this happens and I've just mentioned it now. Frustration in hunting is is a patience killer, to say the least. It's happened to me many, many times, and I've just mentioned one of my scenarios now. So the minute you start getting impatient and the frustration starts killing it kicking in is when you is when you make the impatient calls. Make bad stalks, make bad decisions, make unthoughtful conservation practices taking the wrong animals shooting them in the wrong place not judging the correct distance doing small things that could lead to catastrophic disaster for a safari and i know i know it's not easy to lift your head up when you've been chasing a kudu bull for four or five days i know it's not easy to lift your head up walk back to or get back to camp with a smile on your face and your persona were as, as, you know, as energetic as it was when you started the safari. I know that. I know these frustrations. Because it, it's, it's happened. And it happens more often than not. Especially later on in the season when a lot of game has been pressurized and a lot of game is scarce. Guys make the impatient calls out of frustration. So be careful of that. And then the big one, animal care. I've seen it way too many times, PHs pulling their trackers off of, or not taking the time to field dress their animals, not taking the time to care for the animals in the bush, in the mountain, wherever it may be, taking the guts out. Don't be impatient when it comes to those things because that is very, very important, not only for yourself as a PH uh, reputation, but also to save your outfit of um, money by not having to replace capes later on in the season when there aren't any hunters and the income's not coming in or to delay your clients' trophies. It's not fair on them. So, <clears throat> in my take, sorry, excuse me, in my take, 
a couple of extra minutes, half an hour or so, to field dress the animal or um, to really just take personal care of that animal as what you would at, at a skinning shed if you were far away from it or if you are back at the skinning shed instead of going out straight away again to go and after another animal make sure that your track is taking good care of that animal the skins are hung up they cool down they're either in the salt or they're hanging up whatever the case may be um i'll i'll hopefully get get doug on the podcast once again and we can chat about sort certain these sort of scenarios um yes it is it is going to be frustrating for a lot of people but i promise you now it's worth it so just make sure that and then closing off on the professional hunting side of things probably one of the most overlooked side of the safari the dreaded side of the safari for any ph um especially especially if he does if i've got into the habit now and i'm very very fortunate of um <clears throat> once once the safari starts i kind of fill in my register as it goes and as much of the the paperwork as it goes you know along the way so at the on the last night i'm not bombarded with paperwork and scratching around for sites and tops permits and all that sort of stuff so but take the time guys and make sure that your paperwork is correct <laughs> Because this has become a huge issue and a very bad habit in the industry, especially with professional hunters. Be the guy that breaks the mold and make sure that your paperwork and your admin side of things on any safari for any outfitter is done to the best of your ability. Whether it takes you an hour or three hours to complete, make sure you put in the time and you double check, you triple check your work. Because once that client leaves, it's not an easy process after that if there's a bit of paperwork that isn't correct. Fortunately, from our side, Splitting Image do a great job in making it a lot easier on us. But don't take that for granted. Make sure that you put in the work and make sure that you double check your paperwork. Every outfitter is going to have a different scenario when it comes to paperwork at the end of the hunt as far as carcasses, skins, and all that sort of stuff is concerned. Your side, make sure it is 100% correct. One of the most important aspects of any safari. You guys know that. So yeah, guys, closing off on the PH side of things, I hope that that helps you guys. Um I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys listening to this um, have been in these sort of scenarios. Um, It's not easy. I know it's not easy. Um, However, for the best part of it, it's it's always better to learn from these experiences and implement it into your ability or your safari going forward. Um, Like I said, it's probably not going to be for everyone. And every a lot of professional hunters out there, good professional hunters, have probably mastered a lot of these that I have spoken about. However, I hope there are a couple of guys out there that will be able to take something from this and utilize it um, on their next safari or with their next client. And take that and, and have a better understanding. Um, and hopefully it, it makes the whole experience a little bit more enjoyable. So getting in to the client, the hunter hunting side of things um this is also one that and i left hunter second so that a lot of these points you can relate back to the professional hunter if you are listening to this from a client's perspective um one of the big things that i've seen as far as clients is concerned is understanding the routine of the professional hunters in camp and what i mean by this is a lot of clients get frustrated like i said on the pa side i said clients come out especially guys on this first safari they jacked they pumped with adrenaline they're excited they want they want to do things they want to get out there they want to see things they want to see animals they want to shoot they want to shoot at the range they they the adrenaline and the excitement is at an overload right at the start of the hunt I know it will be difficult, but try and calm it down and 
get into a routine as quickly as possible or understand your professional hunter's routine as quickly as possible. So what I mean by this is <clears throat> some professional hunters have a six o'clock uh, meet at the lodge. Um, they head out by half past six, so meet six, have a quick bite to eat, cereal, toast, a rusk, coffee, whatever it may be. Head out, do a morning session of the hunt, um, and then normally come around come back either for brunch at around about 11 o'clock um, or come back for lunch at around about 12 o'clock, 12, 1 o'clock. And from there, they'll either have an afternoon break because a lot of the animals at that time are either bedding down or, you know, they hovering around under the shade or, or, you know, getting out of the heat of the sun. And then the professional hunter will pick it up towards the later parts of the afternoon. Some go out, um, I'm a big fan of going out between half past two and three o'clock. Some will go out from three to four and then put in an afternoon or evening session of hunting. I've had a lot of success, more success in the afternoon than I have in the morning um, on certain species. <clears throat> so that's what I mean by routine and be patient about that. I know there's there's been so many scenarios where you sit at the lodge and uh, you've eaten lunch, you've eaten brunch and you're so frustrated because you're only going to go out in the next two hours or so um on days that that happens it's it's very very important to be patient with that sort of scenario because the professional hunter has done this before he knows what he's going after i'm i'm almost sure the majority of the professional hunters would have planned this the areas they're going to um, where they're going to and what species they're going to be hunting in the afternoon and that way they've developed a plan and, and a way around it a lot of the time I've seen, <clears throat> and I started my career like this, is when um, if I saw a big kudu bull on, on a certain side of the mountain, I would clock him in. And what I mean by that is if I saw him at like half past four in the afternoon glassing and we weren't going to get over there by the, by the time it was dark, I would clock him in and say, okay, that kudu bull's appearing on that, on the south or north facing slope at around about four o'clock. Um, we need to be at that position at around about half past three waiting for him to come out out of the riverbed or wherever it may be <clears throat> so as a client understand that a lot of these professional hunters would have worked their way up into these sort of situations or planned themselves into these sort of situations there will be a, often a, definitely when you're hunting different species that aren't on the property where those afternoon naps won't be there they would be filled up with traveling to the other property or um, lunch prep going out making sure you're sitting over watering holes and certain scenarios like that so understand that filling in and and embracing your professional hunter's routine is very very important for the morale of the safari number one but number two also just it's very important to not frustrate yourself and get impatient about it because you need to be understanding of what his routine and why he's doing things this particular way so yeah that's that's very very important um <clears throat> another another side of the safari that uh, i've seen a, a lot of clients get frustrated about is when you when you'll glass a particular animal for instance it, it's happened to me on on quite a few blue wildebeest for some reason but you'll glass a herd of blue wildebeest and you'll pick out a couple, like two or three bulls and you'll say to the client, so those are nice bulls, but they, they're just not quite what, we've looked, what we're have what we looking for. Um, and then you'll go to another herd and two or three herds later, you've, you still haven't chosen a trophy for your client to shoot. And he's sitting there in the, in the pickup or he's sitting there on the rock next to you and he's like, geez, I like, You've taken me to all these animals. There's there's an abundance of blue wildebeest, but you haven't let me shoot one. All I've got to shoot is a decent representation of, of the animal. But we're sitting back as professional hunters and saying, well, we'll hang on you. And, and Carl touched it perfectly on the podcast on the last episode is that, hang on you. This bull, he's an ass bull. He's old. He's got, well, he's got good bosses. He's got good size, but it's just not quite old enough for us to take right now it's either early on or late in the season let's you know let's just keep looking 
most of us have hunted certain properties before we kind of know the patterns of the blue wildebeest and we've seen a bull in that herd and we've seen a bull in that herd that you know you would save for your next client or if the client current client you're hunting with has shot a big blue wildebeest and you you always just glass in different herds you know for your next safari so understand that your professional hunter has got a plan for you he wants to give you the best possible possible conservation bull that he has a lot of a lot of professional hunters are going to be hunting for size so if they are going after the biggest one i'm going to probably piss a lot of people off by saying this but that should be more frustrating than anything else if you've seen a good old bull that's got good mass he's old he's done his deed <clears throat> That's the right bull. And if he's passed on that because he wants to go and shoot a 31-inch blue wildebeest, well then sure, you've got every reason to be frustrated with him about because that's not why we are doing what we're doing. And there's only one way to break the mold and break the 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 bad habits of the past, and that's and that's to do things the right way. So yeah, in that scenario, you have every reason to be impatient and frustrated with your professional hunter. Um, and then once again, guys, just on the hunt as a client, embrace a moment. <coughs> Excuse me. Too often we, we find ourselves in the chase and we don't often stop, look back, stop, look down, stop, look right, stop, look left and embrace the moment of what we're doing. The sights, the sounds, the smells. I often try, especially, you can smell animals. And you can smell, like, like the other day we were walking through the bush. I can't remember where we were. Um, and I still I still turned over to Jeff. I was like, yes, you can smell the air. And it's thick. And, I, and he said, yeah, no, you can smell that too. And I think it was after, I think we were going after like Red, red Hearted Beast or something. I think it was on Zach and Lacey's hunt. And, um... We had a missed opportunity and we got into this thick thorn tree um, ravine. And you could see that there was movement on the ground. The ground's so hard here, you, you can't see a definite footprint. However, you can see marks on the ground going through. There was definitely traffic coming through here. And um, I turned to Jeff and I was like, yes, I can smell that, yeah. Because it had such a distinct smell, something I've very rarely smelled before. And Struis Bob over the next ravine they were there so embrace those moments inject it into your adrenaline and, and embrace that because that's not going to be in north america you're not going to have a herd of red art to be running through the plains of north america and smelling that smell you know so take those little moments stop realize what you are doing embrace them and um it it adds to the whole experience of any safari and for me, that's a special, special part. And then, just to close off on embrace in the moment, embrace your professional hunter, taking the time to take quality photos for you to take back to show your friends and family. Um, <clears throat> embrace the time that he's getting to show you the unique characteristics of a springbuck horn or. Uh, a bushbuck skull he's picked up embrace that take that in and and utilize it as part of the experience of the safari not a lot of professional hunters do it but the guys that do it's important to embrace that cherish that because it adds it adds a very a very decent a very unique aspect to the safari um another one i must say the last outfit i was with um actually no yeah the last outfit i was with especially and even on the most recent hunt now with zach and lacy a, a very special characteristic came out um of this this hunt with zach and lacy was the the patience and the acknowledgement of the lodge staff the camp staff um Every morning you would find them having conversations with the lady that was helping out at the lodge. You would have them having conversations with the people cleaning their rooms, 
cleaning the garden. It was just a constant acknowledgement that, hey, guys, I appreciate your work. Or, um, yeah, you know, tell me about your day. How was your day? Was it was it good? I know you were making food for me the whole day. <laughs> but, um, you know, th- that that is a very, very special. And, and although it does take up, there's a bit of a time factor to it. And that's why I've, I've labeled it in here is because it does take patience to understand that. Um, we had a chef at the last safari place I worked at called Max. A lot of the clients enjoyed understanding Max and, and getting to know him and um, complimenting him on his on his food and, and chatting to him about certain scenarios. And then likewise with some of the bar guys that were there. Um, it was a very special and unique way that I saw a lot of clients engage with them. And I think that meant a lot to them more so than actually just receiving a tip at the end of the safari. Um, <clears throat> and then most importantly is acknowledging and spending time with your tracker because that encourages him not only to look after your trophies as best as possible. Yes, uh, I will get a lot of flack for this. It is his job to look after your trophies as best as he possibly can anyway, but he's going to go the extra mile the more you build up that personal relationship with them. And... Um, for me, that is very, very important. And you leave you leave there with a very special place for them in your heart. Um, and then I spoke about it in the PH inside. It's important to embrace the frustration. And what I mean by this is that when you have had a frustrating couple of days, you haven't got your kudu after day three yet, embrace that. Because... That is part of the hunting experience, is the frustration. And use that to motivate you to work 10 times harder in getting this bull, number one. And number two, if it happens on this safari or the next safari, it's just that a little bit more sweeter. And you know it's coming. I'm, I'm about on the 27th of July. I'm heading out for the Letre that has eluded me for little over a year now i've been after him several times with a bow and a rifle and no success but i know i know if he doesn't because <laughs> he's an old bull so if he doesn't die by all, of, from old age i know that when i finally sink the eight ball on him I will look back at this hunt and, and cherish it for a very, very, very long time because it's special. It's frustrating, but it's special. And um, take that. Take that as an opportunity to understand that this is a very unique situation. You're bonding with your professional hands because both of you are the mooring. And what I mean by the mooring, you guys are frustrated at each other's throats and busted stalk after busted stalk or... or Spotting, not getting close, getting too dark too quickly, or whatever it may be. Once the success, or once the stars align, and you'll look back at those moments and realize how special they actually were. So that's what I mean by embracing that frustration. Embrace it. Take it in as part of the safari and say, just this time was, was very, very frustrating. But next time. Um, acknowledge the accomplishment like I've mentioned now when the stars do align acknowledge that you know take a little bit of extra time appreciate what you've done the hard work you've put in but most importantly appreciate the animal for what it's you know sacrificed for you when your professional hunter is setting it up for photos sit back sit quietly and take it all in appreciate the the beautiful coloring of the animal the unique horns the ridges on the horns the the tear ducts on the eyes the sense that it releases appreciate that because once he's loaded up on the pickup and the skin's off in the skinning shed those moments are gone and you can't recapture them so whether you attend safari veteran 
or you're a first timer coming out, appreciate that side because you never know when it's not there anymore. <coughs> and then last but not least, on every safari, it was a question uh, I ask a lot of clients is have you guys appreciated the smaller things about the safari? The orange sunset at every single day. The cold beer when you get to you when you get to the lodge. Your chocolate on the pillow when you go to bed. A nice warm hot shower after a long day of stalking. Cleaning your ears of the dust that's <laughs> That settled in there. Small moments of a safari often lead to big memories in life. And it's a part of Africa that I think brings a lot of people back, all those smaller moments. The hoopoos in the tree, the hardy dogs in the early hours of the morning. Take that all in. Don't take it for granted. There's never a bad situation to stop your professional answer and just say to him, you know what, hang on. I just want to look at that. I just want to take this in. I want to take that noise in. I want to take that smell in. Whatever it may be. All of these things that I've mentioned are are time-consuming, are not part of the plan. You often stumble across them when you least expect it, but be patient about it and take it all in because you never know when it's going to be taken away from you. That's the important part. So guys, to wrap off, to wrap up, sorry, wrap off, cheese. To wrap up on patience, It's a part of my hunting career that I will I'll always cherish, not because where it comes from, but because of what it's taught me. It's a part of my hunting career that I utilize in my everyday life now. The high intensity of the chase and all that sort of stuff has kind of fallen away. And appreciating and taking the time the extra little bit of time in doing things the correct way does seem time consuming but it's all part of the learning curve and it's all a part of being patient so if you haven't yet I would appreciate it if you guys hit the subscribe button turn on the notifications and if, this, if you enjoyed this episode Drop a comment or a like or a thumbs up, really, guys, like mentioned earlier. It goes a long way. And like my old man would say, my boy, just be patient. My name is Dylan Love. Once again, thank you to everyone that supported me on this incredible journey. I'm looking forward to the rest. But if you are, happy hunting. Until then, stay safe, stay blessed, stay humble. We'll catch up with you guys soon.